couple of years ago, I made a TV programme about my father-in-law who won a Victoria Cross at Arnhem. And since then, I've been on the hunt for a follow-up, another nugget of incredible heroism in the face of impossible odds. Of course, most war stories are well-known, well-documented and well-celebrated. The Battle of Britain, Rourke's Drift and so on. But one day, while trolling through a second-hand bookshop, I came across a story that's hardly known or celebrated at all. It's the story of an amazing battle, a battle where more VCs were earned more quickly than any other action in the Second World War. It's a story full of ingenuity, pluck and genuine courage. It had the lot. Having read it, I decided to do some digging. And it turned out that while very few people in the outside world know anything about this extraordinary battle, they certainly do in military circles. And they call it the greatest raid of all. the Battle of Britain was won, but the Battle of the Atlantic was still raging, and we were losing. German U-boats were running amok among the convoys bringing supplies from America. Nine million tonnes of shipping had already been sunk, and the shipyards in Britain simply couldn't replace it fast enough. Britain was beginning to starve. Winston Churchill said in his diaries, the only thing that truly frightened me in the war was the U-boat peril. Said he was even more anxious about the Battle of the Atlantic than he was about the Battle of Britain. And then into the equation sailed the Tirpitz. Tirpitz was the fastest and most modern battleship in the war. Even though her armour was a foot thick, she could thunder along at 30 knots. And with eight 15-inch guns, she packed a huge punch. Certainly, the Royal Navy had very little in its arsenal to take on a ship of this magnitude. And that was a nightmare for the people who worked here, in Churchill's war rooms. Each of these dots on this map represents a convoy movement. If Tirpitz got among them beyond the range of the Royal Air Force, we would almost certainly lose the war. It was that simple. There was, however, a drawback to Tirpitz's size. You see, if she were to be damaged while out in the middle of the Atlantic, she couldn't very well go back to Germany for repairs, because that would mean limping past Britain, past the RAF, past our coastal fleet, and that would be a death sentence for her. So she'd have to go to a dry dock on the Atlantic coast of France. But there was only one dry dock on the Atlantic coast of France that was big enough to handle a ship of Tirpitz's size. This one. This is the Normandy dock in Saint-Nazaire. It had been built in the 30s when France was making giant ocean liners. And now, to make sure the Tirpitz could never have a home on the Atlantic seaboard, it had to be destroyed. Now, the only way that you could put this dock out of action is to destroy this gate. And that was a problem. It couldn't be done with a naval bombardment because the mouth of the estuary is actually six miles away in that direction. It couldn't be done with a submarine because this whole area was crisscrossed with anti-submarine nets. It couldn't be done over land because northern France was in German hands. And for two reasons, it couldn't be done from the air either. Firstly, Second World War bombing raids were notoriously inaccurate. Only 22% of bombs landed within five miles of the target. So the chances of being able to hit a dock gate from 6,000 feet in the sky were slim at the best of times. 
it wouldn't be the best of times because right next door to the dry dock were 14 U-boat pens. These were some of the most precious facilities in the German armory. And to protect them, the Saint Nazaire area bristled with 80 anti-aircraft guns and artillery pieces. And in the town itself, there were 5,000 troops. Destroying the dock then using conventional forces, the army, the air force, the navy, out of the question. So, the job was given to a group of men who really had only just been put together. The Commandos. The Commandos were the brainchild of Churchill, who'd seen similar outfits operate successfully in both the Boer War and the First World War. A small number of highly trained soldiers would get in fast, do a huge amount of damage and then get out before the enemy had time to get organised. Churchill liked this. He called it the butcher and bolt approach. So what kind of men were they? Well, if popular myth is anything to go by, they were lantern-jawed killing machines who could headbutt their way through oak doors. The reality, though, was rather different. Gerard Brett, in my regiment, was in my commando, 12th commando, and he'd written a book on the Byzantine age or Byzantine architecture or something. One fellow who got a divinity degree from Trinity College, Dublin. Lance Corporal Potts had been a, a don at either Oxford or Cambridge. They included a poacher, a TT, motorcycle rider, so a mixed bag. What they represented was a complete revolution in the concept of soldiering. Because they were chosen for their individuality, their intelligence, their initiative. And nobody embodied that ethos more than this man, Mickey Byrne. I've got his autobiography here, and what a life. He had a privileged upbringing, Winchester, Oxford, uh, and then he met Guy Burgess, the chap who went on to become a Soviet spy, and they became lovers. Uh, Mickey, though, became a Nazi sympathiser, went to Germany, met Hitler, got a signed copy of Mein Kampf, and was one of the very first people to be shown around Dachau, the concentration camp. He knew Bertrand Russell, he knew Audrey Hepburn, he knew the King and Queen, he even met Roosevelt. He really was a Telegraph obituary writer's wet dream. But all things considered, not the sort of man you'd expect to find in a commando's green beret. By the start of the war, however, Mickey had seen the Nazi threat for what it really was, and had found something else to suit his maverick streak. The commandos. People were left to make up their own minds. In war, anybody, everybody may be killed, and what decides the action may be the action of a private soldier who's left to command the trench. It wasn't put like that, but the feeling we were given that every single one of us might be imp as important as a brigadier. We were all individuals, you know. Discipline did matter, of course, but I wouldn't have said it was absolutely first. The commando forces were made up of volunteers from any of the regular army units. And the philosophy of how they went about their daily business was a million miles from that of the conventional military. For a start, they didn't bother with barracks or regimental headquarters because the commandos didn't want to waste training time on mundane chores such as cleaning or maintenance. Instead, they simply got digs in a nearby town. And there was no sergeant major on hand to tell them what to do every minute of the day. Instead of saying, parade tomorrow on the main square in Weymouth, it might be parade tomorrow at 10 o'clock on the... Um, in the marketplace at Dorchester and find your own bloody way there, you know. You weren't shouted at. There wasn't any of this shouting or bullying or any, anything that you got uh, in the regular army. You led by example. So, you know, uh, the officer had, uh, had to do everything that you did. If the officers can do it, I can do it. If the officers can do it. Unfortunately, though, the British Army top brass were a deeply concerned